It all started with the first Force Awakens teaser trailer in November of 2014. John Boyega's face would pop up onto the screen wearing that very familiar Stormtrooper armor. This was a really exciting moment in Star Wars history. It was the first Star Wars film in more than a decade. It also seemed like for the first time in Star Wars history, we're gonna see a story from the point of view of a Stormtrooper, one of the most beloved and most frequently cosplayed character in the entire Star Wars galaxy. There's a whole segment of the Star Wars fandom that was fascinated by the Empire and the men and women who served amongst its ranks. You know, whether they were drawn in by the aesthetics of the Empire or its strength and might or just how evil of an organization it was, it didn't really matter. We wanted to see more of the Empire. Surely behind the helmets and plastic toy, there were ordinary individuals just like you and me forced into doing unspeakable evil in the name of the Emperor and galactic stability. It was a point of view and type of story that I think the Star Wars fandom was completely ready for and looking forward to. Before we continue though, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Ownersaber.com. Today I want to introduce to you guys their themed lightsaber collection. And so right now they're going hard with the DC themed lightsabers. First we have the Bat Saber for the wealthy billionaire vigilante in all of us. Then we have the lightsaber for the alien superhero who can also shoot lasers out of his eyes. And then of course we have the fastest lightsaber in the galaxy, the Flash Saber. That's actually a really cool name. I could totally see some really great crossover cosplaying being done with these lightsabers and the entire store is 30% off right now with free shipping. If you guys are interested in this offer, check out the description down below. Thank you for your patience, on to the rest of the video. And in the following trailers, we were actually teased with an even more exciting scene of Finn now wearing a fighter pilot jacket, a telltale sign of a rebel wielding a blue lightsaber. This is a complete bombshell. Not only were we gonna have a story about a stormtrooper, but that stormtrooper eventually defects to the rebellion and becomes potentially a Jedi. People forget that when these trailers came out, there was none of this hate and animosity in the Star Wars community, which reached its peak during The Last Jedi. And in the wider culture in 2014, the woke and the reactionaries, well, they were still on the fringes of society. No one took them seriously. And that's because the only people who were stupid enough to go around canceling others was, what, North Korea? They had gone after Seth Rogen and James Franco for melting Kim Jong-un's face off in their movie, The Interview. Looking back at it, it was a truly wonderful time. This was also before the uh, Trump-Clinton election that drove everyone crazy and that contagion kind of spread across the rest of the world as well. The casting of John Boyega, a British Nigerian, as the character Finn should not have been a big deal. Yes, there was a small minority group of racists who were angry that a stormtrooper would be portrayed by a black person, but any true Star Wars fan knows that, you know, race is really meaningless amongst the human species in Star Wars because, you know, humans live among thousands of alien species. In Star Wars, humans need to stick with other humans so that we together as a species can discriminate against degenerate Xenos. My opinion about these individuals complaining that Finn would be portrayed by a black actor is that there were just trolls, individuals trying to get a rise out of others, or just white supremacists and other racists who were using Star Wars to basically spread their own message. These weren't actual Star Wars fans. I mean, real Star Wars fans love Lando Calrissian growing up, or watching Mace Windu run around with that purple lightsaber. The majority of the fandom was just excited that we were getting a stormtrooper as the main character in a Star Wars trilogy, but the news media, as usual, focuses on the most controversial and extreme voices because that's what sells papers, and so we get this distorted sense of what the fans wanted. And Disney, to their credit, wasn't just parading Boyega around and claiming how heroic and righteous they were, to have you know a black leading character in Star Wars. Instead, they did the right thing and the smarter thing, which is they hired someone who is talented and charismatic like John Boyega, who just happens to be black. I mean, the worst thing you can do to a person of color or minority uh, is tell the world that you hired them because they're a minority. It completely delegitimizes all of the hard work they've done, all of the struggles uh, you know, they've they've suffered and endured through to get to that position and boils everything down to just their race. It is highly offensive. But then things would go rapidly downhill from there. First news started reaching fans that in China, promo posters for The Force Awakens made Finn much smaller and less noticeable. I don't know if this was a decision made by Disney or by some third party marketing agency hired by Disney to service the uh, Chinese market. I think the latter would actually make a lot of sense, uh, you know, for for a lot of you Americans out there who don't, try, who haven't been to other parts of the world, like let me tell you, man, um, the amount of racism that's out there 
it's, it's a different type of racism, usually driven by ignorance, but there is a lot of racism and prejudice all over the world, in, in Asia specifically, yes, in this case. And, uh, you know, the racism we see here in America seems to be blown out of proportion because it, it is. Because in this country, we actually talk about race issues. We, um, we have the difficult discussions, and this drives a lot of people crazy, but it's important to have these discussions, and I'm really happy to see these discussions taking place because this is very rare. And as you see with these posters in China, they do, they do not give a crap. And more importantly, uh, the lesson here should also be that corporations, at the end of the day, they, they do not care about these causes. They wanna get people into the movie theater and they will go by whatever the local culture kinda likes, okay? For instance, take a look at this. Uh, when 12 Years a Slave was released, the Italian version of the movie poster looks more like Legends of the Fall than a story about slavery. Anyway, The Force Awakens would drop and it really didn't disappoint. Despite having a relatively bland and recycled story from A New Hope, it felt like Star Wars and a lot of that had to do with the chemistry between Finn, Poe, and Finn and Rey. I mean, if you had seen John Boyega in the film Attack on the Block, that was, I think, literally the only other film he had been in, or he had been in two films before The Force Awakens. He's a relatively young actor, but he is an extremely charismatic individual. Kind of like Harrison Ford in his prime, but instead of being super cool and slick, Finn was just a really earnest type of character, which is strange to see in a former Stormtrooper. And mind you guys, these weren't just normal Imperial Stormtroopers, they were First Order Stormtroopers, created by Brendel Hux, the father of Armitage Hux. He was a Clone Wars veteran and he had a very high opinion about the clone soldiers and ironically the Jedi as well. And so he would try to recreate the same type of training environment that the clones and the Jedi had by, you guessed it, snatching babies and then indoctrinating them at a very young age. By the way guys, if the fascist baby snatchers are copying your organization's core strategy for recruitment, maybe it's time to rethink how you do things, Jedi. Brennan Hux would indoctrinate and train the first generations of stormtroopers, and Armitage Hux, his son, would develop a monitoring program to make sure that none of them stepped out of line. Together they had created what they thought was a perfect system of oppression. Now Finn was taken from his family at the age of three, and despite claiming that he was just in sanitations, Finn was actually seen by his peers and at one point in time by Captain Phasma as officer material. Finn received top marks in all of his classes, he was heavily indoctrinated and seen as the ideal stormtrooper. The thing is, even the most evil organizations are going to try to convince the people that they are indoctrinating that they are the good guys. The training never starts with blowing up planets, killing innocent civilians, instead to focus on the basic skills of how to be a soldier and, of course, indoctrinating you into, you know, understanding how important the First Order is. The idea here is to make you so loyal to the First Order and the chain of command that you will one day be able to do great acts of evil on behalf of the First Order's name, overriding whatever innate morality you have. And so Finn was able to exist within the First Order system and not abandon his morals and ethics completely. And that is because he wasn't forced to. I mean, there was a training sequence for the attack on Jakku that was featured in The Force Awakens. And during this training sequence, Finn's squad almost kill a innocent civilian. And they're all like very pleased that they didn't do it. So at least during this period of time before they were deployed, they're still relatively normal people. They also had strict but positive leadership from individuals like the Cardinal, who would eventually be replaced by Captain Phasma. Another incredibly interesting character, she basically lived like a primitive on a dystopian world before you know the First Order accidentally found her. There's an excellent novel, Phasma, that covers her backstory, and if you're looking for something dark and completely different from the usual Star Wars content we see, I highly recommend it. So Finn develops some connections with his fellow cadets. I wouldn't call it friendships necessarily because the First Order was heavily inspired by the Sith and so you still have these very toxic and heavily competitive environments where people are trying to sabotage each other. And this has a lot to do with Phasma taking over. There's kind of like a internal coup in the First Order while they're like trying to escape through the unknown region. And you can tell Finn really, really hates Phasma. Remember me? FN2187. Not anymore. The name's Finn, and I'm in charge. I'm in charge now, Phasma. I'm in charge. Bring it down. Bring it down. And just like the last days of the Empire, the First Order had very strict rules governing their stormtroopers. As I mentioned, General Hux was all about that surveillance state vibe, and so he had everything that the stormtroopers did monitored. They actually weren't even allowed to take off their helmets unless ordered to. And who gave you permission to remove that helmet? I'm sorry, Captain. Report to my division at once. 
But despite all this bullshit, despite all of this oppression, Finn somehow maintains that good-natured vibe that he has. And I think this is what really draws a lot of fans to Finn. He's just a likable guy. And during that first battle on Jakku where we see a trooper go down and Finn tries to help him up, but then that trooper dies in his arms. And what most people don't realize about the scene is that that stormtrooper has a name. His name is FN2003, uh, nicknamed Slip, and he's a relatively clumsy individual. And Finn's had to, you know, spend the majority of his uh, time as a cadet watching his back and making sure he survives. I mean, this is why Finn just freezes. It's not just the death of any stormtrooper he's watching. It's the death of someone he's taken care of for quite some time now. Confronted with this loss and death and just the pointless nature of this battle, Finn has an awakening. And moments later, when he's ordered to gun down captured civilians after the battle, he just simply refuses. Now, Finn could have fell for the quick relief that is revenge. These civilians had just shot his friends, so why doesn't he just execute them in cold blood? But no, instead, he chooses empathy and understanding. You know, all throughout Star Wars history, there are individuals like Finn who are just so good-natured and incorruptible that they make perfect heroes, kind of like Luke Skywalker. There's a sense that no matter what happens to an individual like Finn, he'll always choose the right decision. And I'm not just talking about dealing with the dark and light side, I'm talking about having to fight and kill potentially some of his old squad mates. I mean, do you guys remember this guy? Raider! He's not just screaming traitor because the First Order has released Finn's picture to the entire Stormtrooper Corps. This is actually another one of Finn's old squad mates, FN2199. He's the redhead in the back of this picture. FN2199 isn't necessarily an evil individual either. I mean, uh, during the Battle of Jakku, he was reluctant to shoot those innocent civilians, but, you know, he was just a little weaker than Finn, and he decided to follow those orders. And I guess it's hard to refuse such orders when you have all that indoctrination, all that adrenaline and fear coursing through your veins. Now, as FN2199 continues to swing at Finn, he really doesn't get a moment to actually think about what's happening. He's too busy avoiding, you know, getting killed. Luckily, Han Solo has Finn's back, and he hits the Stormtrooper with a bowcaster. And as Finn aligns himself more and more with the Resistance, he'll have to come to the realization that he is going to run into more of his old squad mates and have to deal with things, I guess. Finn sees the humanity in them. He was actually one of them not too long ago. Using his knowledge of the organization and perhaps even some former contacts he still has in the organization, he can start redeeming his fellow soldiers by saving them from the First Order and bringing them to the light. There's a precedent for all of this. Throughout the Galactic Civil War, you had individuals like Iden Versio, Tamarin, Lieutenant Gorn, Bodhi Rook, Agent Callus all leave the Empire and fight against it. Finn coming to grips with his new reality and returning to the hellish world of the First Order Stormtrooper Corps would have been a very interesting story that could have stood on its own two feet. But, you know, unfortunately, I think the sequels try to do a little too much. You have three strong protagonists here, Rey, Poe, and Finn, and their own personal struggles and stories don't really intertwine with one another at all. And so there's really not enough time to devote to each one of these characters. And this isn't Grand Theft Auto, you know, you don't have like a 60 hour runtime, you have just three short movies to tell everyone's story. And I blame Disney ultimately for not planning the entire trilogy before filming. It's bewildering that they would actually do something so stupid, which is why The Last Jedi more or less completely throws aside Finn's storyline. And then in The Rise of Skywalker, you get that sense that J.J. Abrams is trying to bring back that storyline, but then again, that whole movie just felt like it was rushed and no one really cared about it. Finn does meet Janna, another First Order Stormtrooper who is living with a tribe of other troopers who are defected. Janna and her company actually threw her arms down during the Battle of Anset Island where they were forced to shoot, surprise, innocent civilians. This shows us that Finn is not alone and that he can bring a lot more value to the Resistance by trying to recruit stormtroopers rather than going on random missions to Casino World and taking part in Harry Potter-inspired chases on magical animals. And in the original treatment for The Rise of Skywalker by Colin Trevorrow, they actually had Finn returning the Coruscant, the heart of the galaxy, and leading a stormtrooper rebellion against the First Order. I just get chills at thinking about how awesome this story could have been. And look, there's even Rose Tico standing next to Finn looking like a badass. In the actual Rise of Skywalker, they completely shaft Rose Tico. She has like one line in the entire thing. Which again, just goes to show you that all those words about equal representation, Asian representation by Disney, it's completely meaningful. I don't trust them and neither should you if you're a person of color. 
Which again leads me to my point, if you really want diversity and inclusion, you, you don't go parading minorities like Kelly Marie Tran around because of her race. Just hire people who are talented, and if you do want to hire minorities, good for you, but don't parade them around like that's the sole purpose you did that. I mean, that is completely a selfish and egotistical thing to do. And ultimately, what did the sequels accomplish? It destroyed the Star Wars fandom, it split them into many different factions, um, it shafted John Boyega, it shafted Kelly Marie Tran, and who does Disney blame? The toxic fandom. It actually blames the individuals who watch their movies, which like to me, that's not even a smart business move. And on top of that, I mean, it is America. People are allowed to be toxic. People are allowed to be racist even. I don't approve of it, but like, you can't just silence them. You gotta create like content that convinces them not to be racist. You gotta convince them, uh, you know, that you know what you're doing with the franchise, which you clearly do not. You know, if anything, Disney is the one who should apologize to the fandom. And that's because they hold all of the power. And all they do is really just punch down for some reason at individuals who buy their stuff. Now, it's rumored that Boyega and Daisy Ridley will be returning as Finn and Rey in another film in the future, and it will take 15 years down the road. But for me, I would still much rather see a TV show focused around Finn that could talk about his connection with other, you know, First Order Stormtroopers who defected. Maybe there could be some flashbacks to when he was younger and actually in the First Order. I think it'd be really interesting to see what life is like for these individuals. And yes, they might be fascist, they might be authoritarian, but it doesn't mean you can't humanize them and understand why normal people can also be attracted to such dangerous ideologies. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. Uh, as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.